Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming out. We are thrilled with this event. And I must personally say that two of my artistic heroes are sitting here. One of the first shows I had seen when I had moved to New York about 20 years ago was The Secretaries. And uh, yeah. this, I still haven't forgotten it. Uh, and I'm also pleased to present uh, my academic hero, Sarah Warner, who is also a great friend of Clegg's. So lots of people. So before I turn over the evening to Sarah, I would just like to say a few things. Um, on behalf of Clegg's, I want to welcome you. And I also want to encourage you to make sure that you have our glossy calendar. Uh, we have a few more events this semester. We're very excited about Jafari Allen, who will be here uh, presenting as part of the Queer Black Diaspora event. Uh, and on December 5th, the Clagg Signature event, the Kessler Lecture, will be presented by Cheryl Clark. So you won't want to miss that. Please make sure that you RSVP and join us for those events. I just also want to say Clagg's receives less than 20% of our funding from the Graduate Center. Uh, and in these very difficult fiscal times, we are hurting. So any help that you can give, I know we shook you down as you entered uh, getting uh, any kinds of small donations, but we encourage you to please become members, uh, contribute to the organization so that we can continue to present fabulous events like this. So uh, if you haven't already, sign up um, with one of our staff members and um, we'll make sure that you get on the, on the email list and you're receiving all of our propaganda regularly. Uh, and one last thing, I just want to thank the incredible staff of CLAGS, particular, particularly Ben Gillespie, who organized <laughs> this queer pedagogy, uh, queer uh, performing query series. I forgot where I was for a second. Uh, performing query series uh, that we hope to continue next semester. Calais Westerling, who uh, deals with all of our digital. And Noam and Alyssa, who were sitting at the desk as you entered. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to present Sarah Warner, who is an associate professor in the Department of Performing and Media Arts at Cornell University. She is the author of Acts of Gaiety, which is an incredible book. And I encourage you to uh, go to Amazon right after you go to the Clags website to <laughs> donate and uh, buy this book. Um, uh, Acts of Gaiety, or LGBT Performance and the Politics of Pleasure, uh, received the ATHA Outstanding Book Award, an honorable mention for the ASTR Bernard Hewitt Award, and was named a Lambda Literary Award finalist. So, Sarah Warner. I'm absolutely delighted um, to be here and, and thank Ben for the invitation and, and Jim and everyone at CLAGS. I was on the board for a number of years and have been coming to CLAGS events since I was a graduate student at Rutgers. So it's, it's an institution that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I am sitting uh, uh, beside the luminous Mo Angelos, um, who has been one of the <laughs> one of the five lesbian brothers since 1988. Ow! Uh, as I'm as I'm sure many of you in this room know, this troupe of sapphic satirists. Um, uh, <laughs> Have, have thrilled and delighted us with, uh, with a number of plays, and this group has received a Bessie and Obie and other dustable honors. Um, Mo has also collaborated with the Obie Award-winning Builders Association as a performer and writer since the last century, um, and has appeared in a number of their productions in several uh, countries on several continents, most recently Sontag Reborn. <laughs> Uh, she's been involved with New York City's WOW Cafe, that crucible of lesbian performance, <laughs> since 1981, and has appeared in the work uh, of many off-Broadway off, off luminaries, including Carmelita Tropicana, Ann Bogart, Holly Hughes, Lois Weaver, 
Kate Stafford, Brooke O'Hara, Half Straddle, and the Ridiculous Theatrical Company. Um, <laughs> This, this year, um, she's, a, she's an affiliated artist at Sarah Lawrence, um, where she's uh, teaching the young people how to make solo work. Oh, how I wish I could be in that class. Um, also with us tonight uh, is the amazing Lisa Crone. Um, yeah. Whose work has been widely produced in New York, regionally and internationally. Her plays include Fun Home, the play I've been waiting my whole life to see. Um, and it's currently playing at the Public Theater, just extended today until December 1st, so get your tickets. Uh, so that's the adaptation of Alison Bechdel's graphic novel with Janine Tesori. Um, she is also the author of the Verizon play, In the Wake, um, which was a Lortel and Glad Best Nominated Play. Um, and it won the Susan Smith Blackburn, oh, it was a oh. finalist for the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize, excuse me. Um, didn't win a thing, I didn't win it. Uh, well, which was produced on Broadway and there are two Tony nominations. 2.5 Minute Ride, an OB, LA Drama League and GLAAD Media Award winning play and 101 Humiliating Stories. Uh, and of course, numerous collaborations with the Five Lesbian Brothers. Um, you can see Lisa um, in the Foundry Theater's production of Good Person at Szechuan, which I had the thrill of seeing on Saturday night uh, with Taylor Mack at The Public. Um, she has uh, received a number of grants and fellowships and is currently on the playwriting faculty at Yale School of Drama and serves on the boards of both the McDowell Colony and the Council of the Dramatists Guild of America. So please join me in welcoming Lisa and Mo. Uh, so they're going to uh, start the proceedings tonight with um, uh, a reading, and this is a scene from uh, the brothers' last production, uh, Oedipus at Palm Springs, but it's a scene that didn't make it into the final um, version of the story. So this is the, the play that had its premiere at New York Theater Workshop in 2005, um, and I won't say anything more about it. Mo, Mo just dug this up. We haven't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we haven't practiced this oh, at actually. all, and probably I haven't looked at it. Haven't yet. seen it in like eight years. So, um, the, so the yeah. should we say a little? Yeah. Am, am I really echoey? Just really echoey. No. All right. Good. Just echoing to myself. Uh, so, Oedipus at Palm Springs. For those of you who don't know, was the brothers' adaptation of Oedipus, in which uh, a woman finds out that her girlfriend. It's actually her daughter. And, um, it's a downer. <laughs> it's a down, yeah, it's, a, it's, so, it's such a drag when that happens, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> and, um, uh, and there are two couples. There's Prin, uh, who's uh, a stone butch, and her 16 years younger girlfriend, Terry. Uh, Terry. Yeah. And then there's another couple, um, Fran and Khan, who... Um, have a child named Basil, a, a little boy, and they've all gone to this resort in Palm Springs uh, because Fran and the couple Fran and Khan are having some um, problems in their relationship, and they haven't had sex for four years. So uh, the the brothers, uh, you know, we wrote collaboratively, uh, having learned our craft at the Wild Cafe, particularly following the example of the Four Bridges Company. And um, so this is a piece of, you know, we just generated a lot of writing together, and this is an example of some writing that didn't make it in. Right, and you'll see why. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as we were in the play, Mo is Fran. I'm Fran. And I'm Con. So we're a couple. Um, uh, Fran and Con are driving in the car to Palm Springs, arguing about caretaking. I'm sick of being taken care of. Well, that's the first time I've ever heard anyone say that. Who doesn't want to get taken care of? I don't, Con. Let me make my own lunch, for Christ's sake. Your lunch. So you're telling me that this whole thing, this whole damn fight we've been having since we got out on the 10, this butch hysteria of yours, is about your lunch? Don't condescend. My lunch is an example, OK? An example of what? That I care about you? That I want to make sure you don't have to eat Subway for lunch every day? What is an, ex an example of, Fran? That 
<laughs> that you won't fucking let me do anything for myself. Make my own decisions. If I want to eat Subway for lunch, that's my prerogative. But honey, it makes you so sick. Fine. <laughs> Why is it your job to make sure I don't get sick? It's my choice. Because if I don't try and take care and pay a little attention, nobody will. You sure won't. You'd eat human kibble every day for every meal if they made it. So what, Con? So the fuck what? It's my life, okay? If I want to make myself sick on Subway, it's my choice. Yes, except A, I get to clean up the mess, and B, it is exercising some very self-loathing part of you that I don't think is healthy for you to indulge. See? See how you act like you know what's best for me? Like you know better than me about how to manage me? Well, Fran, you have wrecked a car on more than one occasion when your blood sugar has <laughs> dropped and you've been driving. You've fainted several times as well. I'm just pointing out the factual record here. You don't always make the best decisions for yourself. But it's my decision. If I make a mistake, it is my mistake to make. You can't protect me from my mistakes. No, but I can certainly try and keep you from driving off the road into it and into a coma because you thought forgot to take lunch and eat something. My mistake, my consequences. Wrong, Fran. Your mistake, our consequences. I don't feel like tending I don't feel like tending to a vegetable for the rest of my life because you missed your lunch and ended up in a ditch somewhere after your SUV flips when you drop off again at the wheel. You shouldn't even be driving at all. Oh, Christ, don't start that again. It's true and you know it. You are not only endanger endangering yourself, but others on the road. I'm going to turn you into the authorities one of these days if you don't behave, Fran. You're getting all bent out of shape about nothing as far as I can tell, and we have been fighting about nothing for miles now, and we're supposed to be going on vacation for the first time since Daldry was born, and I can't believe this is how we're choosing to spend our time together. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end. So, back to the cutting room floor with you. Um, okay, so then, uh, you know, um, we were, you know, we just generate a lot of material using, doing different things, and sometimes we write, we say write a poem, write a song, you know, and... So we just give ourselves exercise. Exactly, and so, you know, somewhere... <laughs> I'm not sure how we got to this title, but um, we gave ourselves the task. We gave ourselves 15 minutes to write the song from the show that's called Tonight, parenthetically, Baby Tonight. <laughs> um, so, uh, and there was no song. I think we just, it was just a random prompt. Uh, yeah, well, we had song titles for some reason. I don't know, but whatever. Okay, so. Okay, so we have my version of the song and then Mo's version of the song. Yeah. Uh, four locations. The song is a quartet. Prin is at the wheel of her Lexus SUV driving home or to the Casita to see Terry. The Casita is where they went on their vacation. Yeah. Fran is drinking a beer and waiting for the last episode of Alias to come on. She's totally checked out. Khan is holding the crying basil, which was what the name of the kid ended up being. Terry is in a robe wearing sex sexy underwear, garters, and a push-up bra. So part of the thing is that Prin and Terry are having sex all the time, right. and they're in one Casita, and Fran and Connor are in the other one and not having any sex. She's in a robe, wearing sexy underwear, garters, and a push-up bra. She's plucking stray hairs from her chin. <laughs> what is the moment? What are they all expecting? Or should the song be their recollection of their accidental orgy? <laughs> Lyrics. Prin, I don't feel so good. Khan, I never in a million years thought I would. Terry, sunk so low, I've sunk so low. Fran, I fucked, I've just fucked everyone I know. <laughs> Khan, I was drunk. Terry, so drunk. Fran, so very drunk. Print. I'll never be able to drink enough to wipe this image from my mind. I could stab my eyes out and go blind, but why am I freaked? It's no big deal. It's just sex, but I feel revealed. I feel so sick. Fran, so sick. Khan, so sick. Fran, no, really sick. I, <laughs> she vomits. <laughs> Terry, so whatever. It's no big deal. We fucked each other. I wish we hadn't done it in front of the baby. <laughs> Khan, we did it. Print. we did it. Fran, what did we do tonight, baby? Tonight? I fantasized about fucking Khan a million times. I've strapped it on and fucked my lady millions more. And years ago, I actually was lovers with Fran. We laugh about it now. Two clueless baby butches reaching out to the only other thing we could see that clearly looked like a dyke. We've laughed about it a million times. So why, oh why, does this feel so horrible? <laughs> my version of the song. Okay. My version of the song. Makes no sense whatsoever, but... Tonight, baby, tonight. Tonight is the night, the one we can't fight. <laughs> the one that's just right. Beyond all insight, tonight, baby, tonight. Last, last night was not the night. 
I thought it was going to be. I dress up all nice and fancy, wore the jeans you gave to me. We went out to dinner. I picked up the bill. I thought I might get lucky. This thought gave me a thrill. <laughs> when, we, when we got to your place, you buttoned up your shirt. I asked you, is there something wrong? And then you went berserk. Your hands were underneath my shirt. My nipples pierced my tank top. <laughs> your touch was like from long ago, hungry, not able to stop. Tonight, baby, tonight. This is the one we won't fight. This one will make it all right. <laughs> Please just suck. Do not bite. <laughs> Tonight, baby, tonight. The windows are oh, oh god, it gets worse. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> the, uh, the windows were all steamed up and it was late July. You climbed on me, so toppy top. I let you, I can't lie. I thought right then things might have changed. With, with your bare ass on the, <laughs> on the steering wheel. <laughs> you kissed me hard with your wet mouth. I couldn't think too much about the car, <laughs> the car that was parking uphill. <laughs> tonight, baby, tonight, it all just felt so right in the moon's, moon's pure sweet light. No more arguing, no more fight tonight, baby, tonight. When my hands were in your shorts, you were so very wet. I couldn't hear the screeching tires on the hot, sticky pavement. <laughs> Slant rhyme. <laughs> Ow. Yeah, people, yeah. Just as your pleasure rose so high, that's when the world went white. I closed my eyes and felt you fly over my shoulder to the right. <laughs> Tonight, baby, tonight, you launched out of sight. It was such a drag. That's why I hate airbags. <laughs> tonight, baby, tonight, yeah. <laughs> okay, now, I don't know why that one did not make it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I always tell my students you have to write badly to write well. Yeah. And I guess that's the proof of it. <laughs> One needs to just be prepared to humiliate oneself to make work. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm blowing my nose, internet. Sorry about that. <laughs> so is it, would these be one of the songs that you would, didn't you have this uh, way of writing where you would wake up in the morning and no coffee, no anything, and you had to write immediately? Well, that, when we went on retreat, that was the first we would always do that. But that wasn't, we didn't have assignments for that. We would okay. just all sit together and write for, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes or something, and then go off and. And the assignments. Yeah. yeah. Teeth brushing. Then. Teeth, yeah, then yeah. there'd be like, <laughs> that was before we started our day. So then when we actually started the work day, we would read whatever we had written, and then that would sort of a lot of times come out of a dream state, you know? So. Um, <clears throat> so the. D despite all the comedy um, it, uh, uh, here and, and in the play, um, Oedipus is ultimately a tragedy. It's a tragic situation, and that sort of surprised critics and a lot of your fans. Um, can you talk about, you know, it's so very, very different than, than the, the satires and the parodies um, from the early years of the brothers. Can you talk a little bit about how you made the, the choice to go there, um, especially if it started as Oedipusy in a Greek diner, um, and then ended up at Oedipus at Palm Springs? I don't know. It feels like a natural progression. I don't know that we made a decision. I mean, we had made the decision to adapt Oedipus, I think, really because, as with Minerva Place, because we like the title Oedipusy. And then, and then we had a, initially we had an idea that it was going to be set in LA at the at a diner called the House of Pancakis. And it was going to be about the fall of the House of Pancakis. <laughs> and, uh, but I think a lot of our play started with that kind of a, like a little hook of a joke that we really enjoyed and kept repeating. But <clears throat> then as we uh, sort of grappled with, and, and we thought it was sort of interesting and funny, this idea of this, you know, woman who finds out that she's, 
like what if the lesbian story was, I mean the Oedipus story was about a lesbian Hansa, that her lover was her daughter. Uh, but then I think we started, I mean I, I think all of our plays have some kind of darker, more mm -hmm. serious underpinnings and I think we, I don't know, it's just sort of where it went. We were interested in, um, I think as we were all along, as you know, was the project of many lesbian writers to figure out how to make a lesbian um, be, you know, a universal protagonist. And um, so there was also the interest in that, you know, to take the seminal protagonist of Western drama and figure out how to make that not just a lesbian, but a butch lesbian. Mm -hmm. And it was really amazing. I mean, even we hesitated to name it Oedipus at Palm Springs because we thought everybody's going to know what's going to happen. And, the, you know, even in that setup, the people were so surprised to find out that this butch character had had a child. Mm -hmm. They didn't, I mean, people really didn't see it coming. And I think a lot of people, even if they know it, that's you were talking about, they for, they forget it as the play. I, when I was in the audience, I heard <gasps> at the end. I mean, it was just all around me, <sighs> domino effect. Yeah. yeah. And I think that was satisfying because, you know, that's how. I mean, sort of what I what was interesting to me about that play was, and people followed the Fran and Khan story. You know, that was the obvious. That that seemed like it was the thing. These two were going to break up if they didn't have sex by the end of this yeah. weekend. I mean, Khan gives Fran an ultimatum and says, you know, either in the next four days we have sex or I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I might have to leave you. And so people were hooked into that story, so it felt like the scope of the drama, the scope of the tragedy was here. And then when all of a sudden, sort of at the end of the first act, it's revealed that, um, and, and you know, it, it should have been obvious because the character of Terry is adopted and she's searching for her birth mother and she's talking about it from the beginning. But it was shocking to people when all of a sudden, you know, they're at this dinner and it gets, you see Prynne figure out through this, you know, rapid course of events that that she's um, Terry's mother. And it was like, you know, all of a sudden the, the scope of the play just went, you know, and I think that's mm. how, I mean, I think people either were like, that's too big of a leap, it feels like a different play now, or they had the experience of being like, oh, that's what tragedy's like. You think this is how far you can fall, and then all of a sudden it goes like this. So I think for people who hooked into it, it felt like, oh, I've just experienced a Greek tragedy. Like I just fell down a well I didn't even know was there. So. Um, 20, 20 years ago now, when the secretaries were at the New York Theater Workshop, um, the management felt the need to alert the audience that it was a satire, that the play was a satire. Um, <laughs> Kate Davey writes about this in her wonderful chronicle of the Wow Cafe, and um, uh, so there was this idea that the audience wouldn't get the humor of the play, that they wouldn't get the, the feminist satire, that they wouldn't get the lesbian humor. Um, and now here you both sit sort of in many ways, the toast of the town with these wonderful lesbian protagonist plays, and both with beautiful comedy that is widely read. What's changed, and and did you ever expect in in that two decade period for that to happen? Well, yeah, the world has changed. You know, I mean, I was sitting in Fun Home, and um, and I thought, oh my God, I cannot believe I'm. This is amazing that this incredible artistry is given this support and is in this venue. It's an amazing show. Everybody go see it if you haven't seen it. Um, and it's about a butch dyke, you know? I mean, that is amazing. Um, so I, I, I don't know if I, I mean, it's, I guess that's kind of the work we were always making, but it's, it, you know, the world, sees it differently now, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm very grateful for that. I'm, I'm, it's amazing, you know, and many people went before us that, you know, did not have uh, the access that we have, and, um, you know, we, we, we walk on those shoulders, and it's uh, humbling <laughs> to think about, but, 
man, wow, it's amazing. Um, but I don't know if I thought in 20 years, when's this fabulous lesbian musical is going to be at the public theater? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, just, no, I, yeah. I, I'm quite surprised at the reception of Fun Home, actually. Uh, and I would agree with Mo, it's happening in a larger context. I mean, I think it's, you know, everybody here has been doing this work, you know? And um, uh, people are still creating this context, you know? There's this, uh, I mean, I think that there's also change in, you know, film and television happening. I don't know if anybody watches The Fosters on ABC Family. I think it's kind of incredible. You know, it's an ABC Family show, but I think it's kind of incredible. Um, and I think there's a, there's, no, there's like this critical mass of believable lesbian characters that are in the mainstream so that, I, and I think it's just happened. I actually feel like if Fun Home had happened even a couple of years ago, I don't know, I, 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 I really thought, you know, that my collaborator Sam and Janine, I thought, they're gonna find out, they're gonna find out once we put this up that it's not, the, you know, the, the limitations of a mainstream audience to see this, and it hasn't gone that way, but I, I do feel like there's some critical mass in the wider context that has allowed people to look at uh, these lesbian characters as, as human characters that they can uh, relate to. But I, you know, whatever, you know, everybody's been working, everybody's been doing that. Yeah, um, and I do think that the, it is part of a wider cultural context, and theater seems to have lagged a little bit behind TV and cinema, Orange is the New Black, the kids are all right. I mean, I do think that there are these amazing critical uh, things, and, and for a while in the, you know, that moment in the 90s when it was like, oh, queer new world, and, and the men seemed to move ahead at twice or three times the speed as, as the women, and, you know, the lavender ceiling was a lot lower uh, <clears throat> for you and for lots of people in this room at that moment, um, and the men were just sort of exploding. Uh, I mean, we still have a huge parody problem in the theater, an enormous, scandalous yeah. parody problem. Yeah despite audiences being primarily right. female. Um, right. Yeah. And possibly going against its own economic interests, according to right, right. some of these studies, right? Um, yeah, indeed. Um, uh, and I'm, remem I'm reminded of your um, stationary heading, and I have this magnet um, that's, I guess, from the late 90s of the five lesbian brothers, enchantingly homosexual yet commercially viable. Right. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Should have brought those. We still have like 700 of yeah. those magnets. Yes. <laughs> so not everybody. that commercially viable. No. Right? But no. <laughs> Sell the dollar magnets. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, in your um, in your work as uh, brothers and your collaborations with other troops and your solo offerings, um, lesbian desire isn't a subtext. It's the text, right? And it's it's very explicit. And your graphic portraits of same-sex eroticism. Um, were the inspiration for the, me choosing this title um, of this of this event tonight? So, what's the difference between staging explicit lesbian desire in a place like Wow, in the New York Theater Workshop, or the public, and then on Broadway? I mean, and I love the I won't give it away for the audiences who haven't seen it, but the the lovely scene with Joan and and Allison in in Fun Home, and all the delicious diary details from from Sontag. Um, what, what are audience responses? How does that differ for you? Or does it differ? Do you just put it out there? I find it troubling if there is, I mean, I think it, all audiences are better when an audience is diverse. Theater is just a better experience with a diverse audience. Because audiences, I mean, theater is an imaginative construction made between what's happening on the stage and an audience. There, there, there is no thing. There is no theater without the audience. It's, and and I think that as they, as audiences, you know, ideally a, a play has different sorts of people in it, and if the, having very different experiences, you know, all these disparate consciousnesses that are um, interacting with each other, and if the audience can, you know, hook. If you have different people who can hook into different parts of that play, they will teach each other how to listen, mm -hmm. and they will have a bigger experience. And I think, you know, we also have, we have a lot of 
lesbian characters now that are authored by lesbians, but we also have, and I don't think it has to be authored by lesbians in order to have actual people who are lesbians, but I think there's also some weird, um, I don't Playboy know. After Dark. What? Playboy After Dark. <laughs> well, not exactly, but I think, I think there's, you know, there, there's a way that it, lesbians get used as metaphors for something else or something, you know, or it just is a way to make a more interesting character to make a, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I have a little bit of attitude about it, but anyway, um, uh, but I, I think, you know, certainly sitting in the audience of Fun Home, it is, I feel better about it when there are lesbians in the audience. And I feel like the straight people in the audience have a different, I might be wrong about this, but I feel like they have a different experience watching it. If they can hear um, those responses, they know what they're listening for. And just in touring my own work, you know, it, I mean, plays like 101 Humiliating Stories, I, you know, made them at WOW and did, did them for lesbian audiences. And then I would go and do them in regional theaters where there were very few lesbians there. And, um, you know, there was a whole stratum of jokes that just fell, fell away, yeah. you know. But then if there were, you know, if there were dykes in the audience, then everyone would get the jokes, you know. And that, I, I think that's not just about being gay, that's about any kind of theater. If you, you know, Michelle Hensley, who does 10, 000, the 10,000 Things Company in Minnesota and does uh, Shakespeare and other classic works in homeless shelters and in prisons and stuff, you know, all of a sudden, audiences hear um, all kinds of things in that text they didn't hear when it was just, you know, wealthy subscription uh, holders. You know, you, you, you hear a lot of different things when you have different people in an audience. Yeah, there was a, a, a woman in the, I was in the second row at Fun Home, and there was a woman in the front row just to, to my side, and she was crying and laughing at the same time uh, in, in one of the pieces, as many of us were. And at the end of the performance, uh, her friend turned to her, who appeared to be a straight guy. She appeared to be a lesbian, and gave her a hug and said, I, I want to have coffee and hear what you're feeling right now, because I didn't get that. And it, it, it's that kind of, I think, conversation. Or I'm just projecting that or imagining it. But he didn't get what she found so moving, but he really wanted to know. Um, and I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing. Right there, pretty amazing. Um, uh, so I would love to talk about uh, these projects, and, and uh, in particular, what I noted as some uh, beautiful and striking similarities between Sontag and Fun Home. Um, uh, both are Songs. Uh, so yeah, uh, that. Yeah. Um, uh, both are, both are these kind of postmodern lesbian coming of age stories. Uh, both are dramatizations of personal memoirs, adaptations that mine uh, diaries and journal entries for content, and both are productions that depict the central protagonist at multiple stages uh, or various stages of her life, um, and, and that the older version of these characters has conversations um, real or imagined with younger versions of herself. Of similarities. There are. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're academics <clears throat> are for, maybe. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and so what is it about lesbian lives and or your experiences together or your training or the work at WOW? Or what is it that, that led you to make these aesthetic choices that really are really resonant and beautiful between these two, these two pieces? Well, it might okay. just be that we were both writing stories based on actual people. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it might just be that. Just that. But it's amazing. All of that is amazing. <laughs> Sarah. <laughs> like. <laughs> We're still loving those similarities. Well, that was no, really I'm, good. That my, was good. my mind is like, wait a minute. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, it, it, it's true. It's, it's memoir, right? So we're both working with, well, not exactly memoir. So but why the multiple characters, at least? Mm. Like, that, that doesn't seem, that, that necessarily has to come from a memoir. What, yeah. what, what's going on in your mind when you say, oh, I want the older person to talk to the younger version of herself, or herself, in the case of Fun Home? 
I mean, my task was to adapt Fun Home. Yeah. Which was. Yeah. Does that. Yeah. It yeah. just does. I just had to figure out how to do that. Yeah. No, I'm not giving you anything. I'm just not okay. going to give you anything. Okay. <laughs> so my not getting anything. So my task was to adapt um, son, uh, son, Susan Sontag's journals. And um, there is not, um, well, you know, she is her own narrator, yeah. right? Uh, but she had a habit of rereading her journals and um, commenting in the <laughs> margins, in the margins, like when she was young. So, like, she's 15 years old, right? And so she's going back and rereading and dating, actually dating, you know, putting a date for her comment, her, you know, comment that she's made maybe months later about some, um, you know, mm -hmm. earlier incident. Um, and uh, I, I, I just thought about that, like, well, okay, she's a critic, you know, from the beginning. And um, so it is that critical voice, which I sort of took as the larger voice, the elder Elder Sontag, yeah. So interrogating or somehow guiding her younger self uh, through these. Who the, the younger self is the journal's voices is uh, speaking the words of the journal, and then this uh, older, mature Sontag is the you know is the polished uh, writer. Yeah. So uh, it, it it just made a frame. You know, she she did it herself in the journal. So. That's what I did. <laughs> yeah. She yeah. she has that quote. She says, uh, in the journal, I don't just express myself more openly than I can in person. I create myself. Mm -hmm. Right. So she's the create the mm -hmm. critic and the creator in these yeah in these journals. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, what well, what's the difference? How is your process? So we started off talking about the process of creating this work collaborative collaboratively with the brothers. Mm. How is your process different when you're adapting someone else's? autobiographical material, their journals and their memoirs, their diaries? Well, you could, you could still ca collaborate. Well, you're collaborating with Janine, of course. Yeah. Of course. And then Allison is still a person that lives and walks among us, as Susan Sontag is not. Right. Um, so I, I could not have direct contact with my, you know, subject matter. Um, but you did have to think about her son, and you mm, had to think mm, about absolutely. adapting Allison's life. I mean, are there some, is that beautiful, or is that tricky, or is it both? Well, it's tough. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to find the right tone, uh, you know, for, because, you know, it's, it's a problem of biography as well. I mean, in my case, because I have these books, and they're telling many, 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 many stories, and so I have to choose what stories am I telling. And, uh, you know, uh, it could have been about her intellectual life only, mm -hmm. her, her academic life, you know, her critical life. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, the stories that are really alive are the stories that, to me anyway, are the stories that she tells about what was happening to her, especially as a younger person. She becomes less of a, you know, raconteur as, yeah. as time goes on, and she uses the uh, journals more like notebooks, like she's writing about this and she's making notes and da 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 her 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 ideas. Uh, but I, you know, I had to figure out how what what story am I telling? So um, yeah, I just took what was what what grabbed me, I guess. And yeah, and uh, yes, I had I, of course I had to get um, permission, get the underlying rights from her estate, which is controlled by her son David. Um, Reef, he was wonderful and very, very generous. Um, you know, he did not make any restrictions on what we could use. Um, so that was amazing. Um, so I feel very, I feel very, very fortunate. Um, but yeah, how do I, how do I tell the story of this person's life? And of course, I think, well, I want, I want to do her justice. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, our project was similar and yet di different. I mean, Allison had made the memoir, and we were adapting the memoir. We weren't telling this. We weren't telling that story. Yeah. We were adapting the memoir. So, in a certain way, we. I mean, I'm just thinking right now that we looked at it as a piece of fiction in a way, mm -hmm. even though it was true. Our allegiance was to the emotional truth of that memoir. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be to the specific truth of what happened. It would have been impossible, because. I mean, that book is so exquisitely made, and it feels 
you know, it, ha it feels like it has this narrative sweep, but there are no characters in a theatrical sense. Um, you know, you talk about the, you know, that we had people at different ages, because in any, you know, that book covers maybe all told 80 years of time, could go back to Bruce's childhood. The narrative voice on the top is our contemporary Allison, and then in between there's her at every age, and then there are things that when you read the book feel like um, you there's a scene, but actually there's a panel, mm -hmm. and there you know there's you know she can be tell the, you know the dynamic tension of that book is that there's a, a a drawing here of her as a little girl, and then there's her com commenting voice on the top, and but that's not there's nothing to do with that in the theater, you know. And I think there was, it took us a really long time to do, to figure out, I mean, also in that book, it feels like you're moving forward all the time, but there are, in a theatrical sense, two events in that book. She comes out, and he kills himself. Aside from that, there's 20 years of her childhood where they live with a secret, and then there's 20 years after he kills himself before she writes the book. So, hmm. what, so how are you gonna make drama out of that? And who are the people, and wh what is the setting? Where are they? And um, so our, and in a musical, I, I mean, I have come to realize in this project that musicals are much more formally demanding mm. than plays even. You have much more latitude in plays. And musicals have to have a very clear driving engine from the beginning. It has to be an emotional engine. And it has to be about one life and death thing. And so in a way, we had to depart from the book, but then in another way, we exactly did what was in the book. You know, that book starts with that little girl who wants to be picked up by her father, mm -hmm. and it ends with her leaping into his arms. So the primal need of the story is a little girl who, in that primal way, wants physical contact with her father. That's the driving need of the book, actually, even though it's more backgrounded, and that's the driving need of the musical. And then, you know, and then we had to figure out everything else that happened um, in between. But we, you know, we had to make a lot of stuff up and conflate things. And, and you know, Allison gave us, I mean, she was an amazing person to adapt. She made all these things available to us. She gave me her work journals from when she worked on Fun Home. She, you know, she's obviously got a lot of other stuff she's written. All of that, we, we, you know, she was fine with us using any of that. She's online. Um, mm -hmm. doing lectures, and then she does this thing online where she just talks to the camera and draws, and it's really amazing. I recommend watching her online. She's incredible. So I transcribed, you know, for months. I just, in the beginning, I just transcribed everything online. And, you know, there's bits of that dialogue in the play, and there's bits of her journals in the play, and, um, and then things that, that we made up. But she, um, you know, when she saw the work and what she said to us since is she's, because when I first, when we first sent her a draft, I said, I want to remind you that we've had to conflate a lot of details, we've had to make things up, and she said, thank you, thank you for reminding me. And then she said, even the things that you made up felt true. Because she's such a documentarian, right? I mean, she yeah. takes the pictures and she puts herself standing there, takes a picture of it, and right. then draws, like, right, right. her process she has a is thing pretty that she'll fantastic. Only do what's yeah. real. And in that way, you know, it is true, she's right, I mean, I think, the thing that I really related to in my work, in her work, uh, was the questioning of narrative and the construction of narrative. And I think that um, th that's her rigor, is to say, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna choose an easy narrative. I'm gonna look at what's true and then grapple with, with that. And I think we tried to make our adult Allison do that same thing in the musical. Um, but, so we couldn't, you know, what dealing with her real family in a certain way, we felt like she's had to do that on her own. That's not our responsibility. But of course it weighed on us. And I think we didn't know how much it weighed on us until a couple of weeks ago when her brothers, John and Kristen, came to see the show. Bruce's, her father's sister came to see the show. I mean, all these relatives came. And it was, it was an extraordinary experience. And um, it was a, they were, I mean, it was very moving all around, I think. And um, uh, I think we felt a huge relief, huge weight off our shoulders when that happened.
Okay. Yeah, it's it's like um, for me, Sontag and Bechdel are sort of like the uh, previous and present versions of the lesbian avant-garde, and it's mm -hmm. also interesting to think about their formal um, interventions right into culture, into literature, into art, and then. You know, honestly, I was like, how are you going to make this graphic novel into theater? I, you know, I was like, well, this is why I'm not in production, right? I mean, I have no, I had no idea. And I was just floored uh, on so many levels. Um, one quick question about that, because I'm thinking also about citation in both of the plays and, you know, who's, who influenced it. It's like the referencing of Sontag's books and what she's reading and the music, and that's so very important. Mm -hmm. Or you made that choice to list those citations. And then, of course, Bechdel and her father have these exchanges about books. So I'm also interested, I'm interested in that. And then also, I don't know if this was intention, was this a choice that you or Sam made? But it, I kept seeing how I learned to drive when oh. they're sitting on that bench. And they're, especially when they're driving, but the use of that bench and the, you know, the inappropriate or questionable or for some people, I'll put that in quotations, right, the, the sexual adventures of the father, and I just kept seeing Paula Vogel there. Was that, am I making that up? Is that intentional? Was that It's not echo? intentional, which doesn't mean to say that it it's not wasn't there, an influence. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. yeah. Um, uh, so um, what, um, what role are you dying to play, or what story are you dying to adapt or tackle next? Wow. Mm. I mean, once you do Sontag, oh, <laughs> do so you answer that question already? <laughs> um, God. Well, I want the brothers to write another play, personally. Yes. Um, yes. So, I'm, but I'm always lobbying for that. Always. <laughs> that is always my thing. Um, so. Yeah, so so I'm so, so tired. tired. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm so tired. I'd like to play a person who's taking a nap. Who sleeps. <laughs> Rip Van Winkle. She'd like to really do it in real time and sleep for 20 years when she leaves. On a beach in the Caribbean, preferably, right? <laughs> Oh, that's okay. I, like I should have a good answer for that. Like, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I also would love to do another brother's play. Yeah. There's many logistical challenges to that. Um, but it would be great. Um, and also, I want to write more musicals with Janine. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, so uh, I, I, I have lots more questions, but I would also like to open it up to um, the audience if, if people would like to jump in or have burning questions. If not, I will happily continue with, with my list of things, but. Speak up. Yes. Um, it was it's it was five years total in development, and um, we were uh, we did two. We were at White Oak, but Sundance. We were also at the Theater Lab, and then we did I think three workshops at the public, including the Lab last year, where we had a sort of modified production. Um, you know, it was clear pretty early on. Very little was clear. <laughs> But it was clear that it was going to have to be developed on its feet because it was about the juxtaposition. It was about juxtaposition as it was the theatrical version of you know that's the way the comic book works and and that it was going to have to be some kind of because because nothing happens. What happens is you know there's this sort of you know you see Bruce with the young man he's having an affair with with the family. 
very low key scene. Nothing is going to happen that's going to change the course of what they're doing. You just see a little bit of tension. So what gives that theatrical viability is that then you have the adult Allison, who knows that he killed himself, who is doing one thing with juxtaposed with that, and then you have the college student who is moving, doesn't know her father's gay, and moving forward into his or into her own sexual discovery, and so the theatrical dynamic comes from seeing those things next to each other. So on the page, it's pretty lifeless, and you and and. Um, and also that character of the adult Allison was the hardest thing to write. And uh, she had, and Beth Malone, who plays her, just did, I, I can't say enough how, the, she, ju I, she just spent years just standing out there just giving the most dead, horrible dialogue her all so that we could see what was there. She's been with it for, uh, for quite a while, yeah, for about three years, I think. No, um, after we did the lab, in the, in the lab we had, uh, I don't know if anybody saw the, the lab of it, but there was a, you know, there was, a Allison's studio was on the set. Mm -hmm. And I think after that, you know, that character felt really um, not dynamic enough. And what we realized was, um, you know, when you're writing, because that's what that character's doing, she's grappling and she's writing, it feels like life and death. But of course, it's not life and death. So watching it, you know, you watch her struggle, and you're then, then you're like, whatever, get over it. You're writing a book. You're going to be fine. There are people who are having real problems. Oh, <laughs> and, um, uh, and I think we kept thinking, as you do, sort of reflexively, it needs to be more specific. It needs to be more specific. And the more specific we made it, the worse it got. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, she's not. She's, she cannot be real, she can't be naturalism. It can't be naturalism. And then we finished that and we went away and Sam and our set designer, David Zinn, came up with that set. I mean, they had the idea, Sam and Janine sort of thought, we, they were like, we need to get rid of that studio altogether. She needs to be inside of it. So basically, the, and we had more drawings in it, you know, and we sort of knew this and we went back and forth with it, but it's not about, it is about her drawing the book, but it's not. That has to be metaphorical. The songs have to be the drawings in a certain way, and everything that happens has to be in her head, mm -hmm. and that has to happen with a light touch. So when David Zinn designed that set, I felt like, oh, now I see how the play can be finished, because that set is dramaturgical. It moves like memory. And then Sam did a beautiful, beautiful job staging it, and we did it just to say, to give a shout out to our crew, we rehearsed in a room that had no revolve, which meant that, first of all, to figure out when the revolve went, there was a model, because, you know, you, so when things would have to move, you would have to, they would have to be physically moved, but even to figure out when it's here at this angle, what angle is it gonna be like when it goes around there? You'd have to look at it on the thing, and then they'd be singing a song, and it would be time for the revolve to move, and the actors, like if they were in a chair, they'd get up and they'd walk like this, and a stage hand would appear and like push the thing around, and it was so crazy because there's a lot of furniture. It was such a crazy thing. And when, um, <laughs> when um, <laughs> Madeline came and saw the last uh, run through we had in the room, and so the stage hands would move it, and then they'd crouch down. And she said, "I'm going to be so sad when all of a sudden there aren't these little people like." <laughs> She said, it's almost like they're Bruce's lovers. They're his secret <laughs> lovers who are crouching in the corners. But the, the crew was so amazing, like what they had to figure out. And they had this whole tarp on the floor they do with all these, I don't know, it was crazy to rehearse a revolve with no revolve. Wow. I, I loved the revolve, and I also loved uh, the closet and how the closet became. Oh, my God, yeah. I mean, the, 
Allison walking through the door and her father continuously going in the closet for different <laughs> things. It was, you know, the set design for that was pretty spectacular. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm making notes for my upcoming article. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so, what about the, the memory? I'm thinking now of, of memory and personal memory and historical memory, and we were talking before uh, it started about what a delicious window Sontag's journals are into the 40s and the 50s. Mm. Um, and, you know, how do you, and then the memory of this previous era with the family of Fun Home, how, and it's so hard to stage memory, right? I mean, it's in the past, and, and if you're trying to stage it in the present, how, how do you do that, right? With the books and the, and the records in help, and so does the holographic Sontag help with that. But, um, you know, they're so haunted, both of these plays. I mean, they really are haunted. Even though they were funny, it seemed to me that both plays were so much funnier than the actual lives of the people or the books that the people themselves wrote. Mm -hmm. um, so the interjection of the comedy makes sort of the tragedies of their lives or the difficulties of their lives in some ways bearable for the audience. But um, did, you, did you have any concerns about interjecting that degree of comedy into either one of these stories? I think Fun Home is really has a lot of lightness and a lot of humor. And I feel like if you see Allison do a reading, and she does readings for the book, there are a lot of laughs. I think people don't laugh out loud when they're reading it yeah. by themselves. But I think there's a lot of humor in that book. Yeah, little dykes to watch out for moments in the book. Yeah, and it also just quotidian moments of their childhood, you know? And, all, and, and it's about really checked out people, which yeah. I think, mm -hmm. yeah. It's always hilarious. So it's always hilarious, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, and Sante, actually, I was always really surprised when people laughed so much, as much as they did in Sante, you know, in the, in the show. Tackle. Yeah. Tackle. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, depending on the audience, yeah. but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I approached it quite earnestly, and I guess maybe oh. that is why, because she's, you know, very, especially when she's young, you know, she's very serious-minded person. And, um, you know, that is, oh boy, that's a big slow moving target, you know. So um, she kind of does the work for me on that one, I guess. Um, but yeah, the, this m memory, I mean, the, I think about the play, the, the, how it is staged as a sort of tr attempt, attempt to stage consciousness, yeah. right? Like, so this is, this, it is a memory, it's a memory play in a sense. Um, because she, but although she is a film or a video, Elder Sontag begins, you know, starts us, and is like saying, okay, here's what we're doing. We're reading these journals. Um, so then, then there's a lot of latitude. Then I can, you know, anything can be there imagistically, and uh, thanks to, you know, the amazing video designer mm -hmm. Austin, Austin, um, and and Marianne uh, directing, you know, like how. Because I can't, I, I, I'm seriously, I don't know what is going on up there. I cannot see anything. There's a piece of scrim in front of me. I cannot see the audience. Um, I can see what's on the desk in front of me, but I can't see what's behind me. So there's projection in front of me and there's projection behind me. I'm in this media sandwich. And I, I, I don't, I, I never know, I don't know what's going on. So um, I can't see that whole picture. So that absolutely must be made by others. And, you know, they, they made it so much more beautiful than I ever could it's have imagined. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's gorgeous, you know. So, uh, but it gives you, you know, get, use video. It, you get a lot of, I mean, please use it well, though. <laughs> um, um, you know, but it gives you a lot of latitude. I mean, you can really pour so much into there. So there's archival footage, yeah. you know, there's, there's uh, all, all, all sorts of stuff in there. So. But I think the... You know, in both cases, there's memory, and I think in both cases there's somebody looking back, mm -hmm. then there are other characters looking forward. Mm -hmm. If you're reading the journals, you're looking at her looking forward, and there's yeah. always humor there, because then you see, right. first of all, the, what the person looking back, how they've simplified their narrative, how they've narrativized their experience, and then how the person looking forward, what they thought they knew what they thought was going to happen, right. what they thought was happening in a given moment. 
And that's, I mean, that's what theater's made out of, really, is those limitations in consciousness, I think. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, any other? Yes, Joan. So it's not only the character who has split consciousness, but the performers with all that going on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what pe people do. I think you 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 go in and out of things. I think it's helpful to step away from things and come back to them and have. You know, it's easier to create in moments of intensity, which you can't really keep up. But I think every, everybody who makes work, certainly who does theater work, I think goes in and out of it like that. Yeah, or, or any creative work, writers, you know, and like, right, you're, there's several tracks going on at one time. But, you, you know, inevitably, okay, we have a performance, so we have to focus on this one. You know, but there, there are other things um, running, running in the background uh, at the same time. But... Um, and and you know that, and the great thing about that is is if I'm you know anxious about one, I start getting really interested in the other one, <laughs> and so instead of you know cleaning out the crisper in the refrigerator, you know maybe I will turn my energies towards some other piece of writing that I'm working on or something, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, those brothers, especially uh, Brave Smiles, it's just one huge citation of, like, pile on the lesbian tragedy, right? I, I mean, um, they're little history lessons in and of themselves. That's part of why, as a teacher, I love bringing those texts into the classroom, whether it's queer performance or American drama, because they get this education within an education. I mean, it's marvelous. Um, so it, it's, it's interesting that you've, you've always done that in your work, and then you're drawn to figures who also have that, that impulse. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, Polly, uh, Sontag actually says, my librarian's mentality, the inability to throw anything out, finding all things, especially in words, interesting and worth keeping. So she, huh? Well, um, you know, it, it, it's, I, I guess it's some, I mean, I don't know, why, why, do we, why do we do that? Why do we make lists, you know? I mean, for me, it's like, I'm just trying to remember <laughs> at this stage of my life. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, because there's something about cataloging that is pleasing, <laughs> you know, um, maybe. And uh, yeah, uh, she was, I mean, I only put like a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the lists that that woman kept. You know, she really had that kind of mind. Yeah, so. Like the list song. In the musical, right? Yeah, and then, yeah, and then Patterson. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then this, and then that, and then this, and then that, and 
you know, and she went back and crossed things off, you know, she, it's like she did them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Me, I just like the list. <laughs> No, I mean, like, there's this list at the beginning of the, the that I use in the show where you know there are so many books and plays and stories I have to read. Here are just a few, and then there's like 45 books, you know, and and those books uh, she probably read most of them that I I can sort of you know trace on further in her life. That's that's more than I and she was 15, you know, and like that's more than I will ever read in my lifetime. So she was also a voracious reader. I mean, she read everything, everything, everything. So. And many times over, she was a, re a great rereader too. So, oh, an editor and a rereader. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I thought my OCD was bad. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Any other questions? Yes. I did, WOW was the seminal, most important event of my creative life. Uh, in no way did I think it had anything to do with a career. <laughs> no. No. Um, and as a matter of fact, I thought. Just wanted to kiss girls. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I thought, uh, you need to. I mean, every day when I went to WOW, I was like, you better figure out what you're going to do with your life yeah. instead of hanging out at WOW. <laughs> I mean, and, I, and I, I think that I felt a little pissed off and remain angry that the, you know, except for the academics who started to write about WOW at some point, the press was not interested in WOW. Um, the critics were not interested in WOW, but they didn't know we were there. And that, because... Uh, there were people like Split Bridges who were doing some of the greatest work. I mean, you know, Split Bridges changed my life. So that, 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 you know, some of the greatest work still that I've ever seen in my life. And it, you know, it didn't get the, it, did, it still has not gotten its due, even though it's much better um, known and better respected now. Um, but, um, uh, uh, but, um, the flip side, flip side of that is that we were doing it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That it was a, it was this community, and I've become obsessed in the past um, year with the TV show Treme. Um, and the thing that has fascinated me about it is that I'll, I couldn't just I was watching it like, what is this thing? And then I read something that Wendell Pierce wrote, and he wrote about uh, culture. That that play is about how. A, an intact culture works, not when it becomes corrupted and it becomes just about entertainment, but when it's the, the vehicle through which you live, the conduit through which you live your life. It's how you celebrate birth and death and your birthday and every single thing that happens goes through. And I thought, oh, that's what was happening at WOW. It's we, we made culture every day out of everything that happened to us. We lived there. The audience and the performers were the same thing. And because no one was paying any attention to us from the outside, we were pleasing ourselves. We could do whatever we wanted. And so I think what I take, which is the most, val I, I can't think of a more valuable thing that I could have gotten as an artist, is that I, you know, I've, you know, roughly made my living in the theater for many years now, and it, I feel very fortunate about it. And, uh, but I don't ever think that Th those things are coincidentally happening. <laughs> My life as an artist and me making a living don't actually depend on each other in any way. And hmm. I know that who I, th that I have the, f the freedom 
to get in a room with a bunch of people and make whatever I want whenever I want to make it. And that that is the core of what, it, what matters to me. And so, um, and I came from that, and I try to live with those, I, I feel like I'm constantly fed by that, and I never feel like anybody can take that away from me. I can always make my work, because the thing that matters to me doesn't have anything to do with outside infrastructure or money or any of that. It, o it only has to do with that, with that, that sense of wholeness that I was given at WOW in the beginning, so. Very well said, Lisa. I would only add, and kissing girls. <laughs> uh, I, I will just say, I, I mentioned it earlier, but for those of you who don't know the book, Kate Davies, um, uh, Lady Dix and Lesbian Brothers, The History of the WOW Cafe, and recently I had the extreme pleasure um, to preview uh, a book that's in the work called Memories of the Revolution, um, the first decade of theater at the WOW Cafe uh, by Holly Hughes and Carmelita Tropicana, which we all hope is out next year. Um, but both of you have pieces uh, in that buttercup and Tara Dykes Alley. Um, so, uh, so definitely look for that. It's going to be extraordinary. Um, yes. Um, well, kissing girls. Um, <laughs> that's my answer for everything. Um, no, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope I, that, uh, you know, I, 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 I have a, I have a ragtag career as well, and um, I can make my living in the theater when I'm actually performing. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm teaching. Uh, the, I'm. Uh, Whatever I'm teaching this semester and next semester at Sarah Lawrence, so that's uh, great for me. Um, so I think I, I hope I am I hope I am trying to communicate to these um, to these young minds that um, it is you know it is you can do it you know it is not I'm not saying it's going to be easy at all but you can follow that thing that Lisa was talking about inside you you know, that makes you feel like, okay, this is where I belong. This is where I feel whole. And you can <laughs> stick with it, you know, to stick with it. And to, to just try and give them a practice, you know, like what, how are you going to make shows, you know? This is what you need to do. You need to figure that out while you are here because no one is going to ever give you this time again in this way. So take advantage of it, you know. So, Lisa? What do you try and teach? We have three small children in our show, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been really interesting. Um, they're incredible um, kids. Um, it, they're, they are. they're incredible, yeah. They're amazing. And um, I have to say, I have really loved, we had a really, and they're asked to do a lot. Uh, and I, we had a great, they're, they're very integrated into that cast. That cast all really loves each other. And it's a great atmosphere of them simultaneously being children and cared for and treated um, in the best ways like children. And to watch you know, small people like that do meaningful work and to watch them be given a great deal of responsibility, um, creative responsibility, uh, and to see them step up so happily to that challenge. Uh, I just find that the humanity that is given to those children to express and the way they're treated like, you know, small people um, 
I, I really loved being in that atmosphere. And, um, you know, I, years ago I heard Lee Brewer say, if you don't want children in your rehearsal room, you need to think about why you're doing theater. Hmm. And there's, uh, that's a little bit of an overstatement probably, but there was something really, really great about having uh, children in the room and in the process. And, um, you know, that little Sidney Lucas who plays small Allison Stunning. is... Uh, extraordinarily talented um, girl. And she's not just um, inspired, she's, I mean, George Wolf came the other day and he's, as soon as he saw her, he said this, he said, that child has craft. She is a working, thinking actress. And it's really true about her. She's really incredibly talented. And um, I feel happy that that, that, that girl who, is going to have many, many, she's about to go into her preteen years, she's about to have many, many opportunities. That she will have had an experience of playing this part, and she will have had the experience of being treated the way she's been treated in this process. And I hope, you know, I think a girl like, when I mean, girls are vulnerable, she's going to be in a world where she's not necessarily, I mean, I hope that she is, but, you know, I, I just hope that she carries that, you know, that, that helps her in um, some way as she goes forward. I want to tell this one story about Peggy Shaw as we're talking about being young and sticking it out in the business. When Mo and I were first at WOW, we, oh just, we, we thought, <laughs> oh, what if we did a show that could tour? Um, yeah. we, did, we did, you know, one of the sort of a proto brother show, and then we're like, well, maybe we could go on tour. It seemed like a good idea. So I went to Peggy and I said, Peggy, can we, you think we can tour a show? And you know, I was right out of the Midwest. I said, <laughs> You think we could tour a show? Peggy's like, yeah, totally, totally you could tour a show. I said, well, what do, we, what do we do? Could we go to London? She goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, what do we do? She said, well, you get on a plane, you go to London. Um, <laughs> and I said, okay, and then what do, we, what do we do when we get there? She said, you go to the dyke bar, and you go to the bar, and you tell them you have a show. And I was like, okay, all right, okay, okay, okay. Um, and then, okay. And she said, yeah, somebody will, somebody will let you do your show. And I said, and wh where do we stay? Oh, just tell somebody you need a place to stay. Somebody will let you. And I said, and we can make enough money? And she was like, yeah, totally. And I said, like, you can make enough money to, to buy our food? And she said, we steal your food. And then I was like, okay, 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 okay. I see, I see. Right, right, right. I'm never going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do it. But they were my heroes. <laughs> they still are. <laughs> Uh, we did go to London, actually. The brothers went to London. We did. We did. But we didn't steal our food. Didn't steal anything? Mm. Mm, no. A few hearts, maybe? Mm. No. <laughs> I don't know. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, she's amazing. I, I think she's a really smart young actress. But I also think that, you know, it's a different world. And I think one of the things that I had to, that came up in rehearsals a lot was what it was like to live in a closeted world. You know, there were, there were assumptions, yeah. particularly when, when Medium Allison goes home. Yeah. And we talked a lot about that scene. You know, she was, you know, she walked in and she was like, this is my girlfriend, Joan. And I was like, I, I don't, Think you have, you know, she she asked me to change the line where I, uh, I'm trying to remember how it went, but you know, she says she's going to be staying in this other room. She's not assuming they'll be in the same room, and she somehow wanted to. She, she her inclination was to change it so that she was more assertive about Joan's position. And I said, I don't, you you don't have any examples, you know. I said. Well, one of the things that happened to me when I went to WOW was I was like, oh my God, these people are out all the time. You know, you had to learn to be out. There wasn't, it wasn't a thing. Now you can see, I mean, not that it's still not difficult for people to come out, but there wasn't that context. Um, and certainly, you know, if you were going home to your family, that was something, you know, you would have to 
every minute had to be negotiated, and your assumptions weren't what your assumptions would be now. Um, so I think that you know Sydney has a different set of things to think about in the world. Also, Beth, who plays adult Allison, is a dyke, and she um, was also she was all you know at the lab. I saw her like side coaching um, <laughs> all the time, you know, and and uh, ta talking to her about you know how she would walk and how she would stand, and um, and I think you know Sydney's. I think, you know, Sydney's a, a kind of a femmy little girl, you know. In Al for Short, one of the things, you know, the song where she fantasizes about, um, she has that fantasy song, and the choreographer had to say to her, because uh, there's a moment where she becomes the, you know, the French woman who's looking at her, and, and uh, Danny, our choreographer, had to say to her, you enjoy being Al more than you enjoy being the French woman. <laughs> you know, that's the way the song goes. But, you know, <laughs> But uh, uh, Sydney can take a note. You know, she can take a note. She's a very smart young actress, and one thing that she can do really well is to play um, yearning and pa passion. You know, she's just really good. Yeah, and 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 I remember perfectly the 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 yearning and the desire on the young Sontag, but a yearning and an eroticism for everything, mm -hmm. for learning, for women, for yeah. adventure, right? It, yeah. it was just, you played that so well. Yeah. It was just great. Um, well, she got her education from books. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, that whole thing about Gide, about reading yeah. Gide's journals, you know, she really devoured those and took them, you know, to heart. <laughs> and I think it gave her, you know, a possibility, right, through literature. Yeah. So yeah. that was her example. And a lot of it was through you know, gay male mm -hmm. uh, desire as yeah. you know, well, primarily even yes. for her, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. which was interesting mm -hmm. too. Yeah. yeah. Jim, did you have, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, at the beginning you had been talking about the mm. and uh, I just wanted you to talk about uh, what the initial connection to polarization or practice is. I don't remember that happening. Do you remember that happening? No. Do you, what's Kate, the? Yeah, Kate. Uh, Kate said that there there were little slips in the program. Kate and Jill both say this. There were little slips in the program, mm -hmm. and then there was actually a sign in the lobby. And uh, I don't remember if it's Kate or Jill Dolan's reading of this, but uh, it, because of AIDS activism and in crises, and because it was blood sport and about killing this lumberjack with the chainsaw. I think there was a little bit of misreading and mm. certain people leaving the theater. Oh. And, and that's their reading of We didn't the, know I mean, about that. We first did it at WOW, <laughs> and it, we didn't have any yeah. problems there. We yeah. did it in Houston. They loved it in Houston. Oh, my God. They and love then, a girl with a gun, uh, The man. place where we had the, the problems was at Theater Rhinoceros in San, San Francisco. Francisco. They, are very, they, they were very unhappy with us, those lesbians. <laughs> A, li a little too earnest there at the rhinoceros. They're very time? earnest, yeah. and they what were they? They left comments that said things like, "Do you remember it was something like?" No. I don't know. They thought we were they were negative stereotypes, and they weren't oh. in favor of it. And they were very yeah, they were very earnest about it. More and, and like just what we don't need: man killing, lesbian stereotypes, something oh, like that. You're like, ah, oh, loosen up. Yeah. <laughs> um, like that's so overdone. <laughs> Yeah, they walked out, and they didn't laugh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mission dikes are a hard sell sometimes. Sometimes. Um, I, I have to say that is that that's not only my favorite brother's play, but one of my favorite American plays. And I am struck any time. Um, you know, I'll spend a week or two on that play in class. I'll really, you know, have a good time with it. And it just, I sometimes I get so sad because I can't convey to the students that. You're not making fun of the secretaries. Like you're, it, you're not. It's not meant to be a caricature of right these women who work in offices. But that's where they they go. Yeah, it's yeah. it's to laugh at them. Right. And so for years I've wanted to do that play. Uh, well, not that my department would ever do that play, but uh, one day I will succeed. But um, but but I don't want to do it until I figure out how to talk to the students mm -hmm. about the kind of humor it is. 
Um, even if I make them read my article on that play, they somehow, you know, it's like I can't, I can't convey that. And so um, I, I, it, it doesn't surprise me that audiences misread it and even lesbians misread it, right? Because mm -hmm. the humor is so smart and so subtle. It seems like an over-the-top parody, but it's actually, pure, it's just brilliant, that play. Brilliant. Yeah, sometimes we go to, um, as we like to say, off brothers productions, <laughs> um, yeah. off off brothers productions yeah. of the secretaries that we're not involved oh. in, and you know we just go see them, and it, they're, they're, it, it's really interesting to see what, um, like the it, it it's usually very easy for the actors and whatever the whole yeah. thing to get around um, the women, um, you know uh, well anything you know anything. The body image stuff, you know, that the laughing about fat people, okay, sure, you know, they can go there. But the darker part yep. of it is is often a little, uh, yeah, missed. Yeah, and, maybe, and the or, violence that women commit against other women, right? Sure. That, the emotional that, violence. Everything, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even though they're being Heathers the minute they leave the class, right? Like, they're doing it, but they can't see it. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's fascinating. And then sometimes the, 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 uh, the thing t happens too, where it th they they get like super lesbo about it, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, you know, the ladies are like all falling over all other. over each other, and it's like, no, 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 no. Dawn is the office lesbian. That's it, okay. Mm -hmm. But you know, yeah, yeah. So they uh, they over lesbify it because it's the five lesbian brothers. Yeah, you know, at the so. Hollyhock Inn, it's yeah. just like a big orgy. At right, the, right, yeah, right. At the retreat. Yep. Yeah. So <sighs> yeah. Instead of it's just Victoria's Secret catalog. That's yes. You know what we're talking about the eroticism of Victoria's Secret catalog. <laughs> right. Okay, I have another question. Um, so, uh, what is the experience or the event or the production that you're most proud of? Is it your current work? Is it, you know, these magical things that you did at Wow? These fearless, brave, crazy, perverted things. Um, what, what is it that you're most proud of? Oh, gosh. Uh, wow. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, proud of. I, I, I like that I have, I, I, I have enjoyed continuing to do different things. So the pleasure you take in it, in that you, yeah. I love collaborating. I really love collaborating. Yeah, so like I've had really, really, really great collaborations. Great, fantastic, um, and it's and it's it's hard to do that kind of work, right? I mean, it's it's like you know, lesbian processing one hundred and one, consciousness raising. It's all of that kind of stuff, but uh, it's sort of worth it at the end. But in the middle, does it ever frustrate you when you're doing those? It's <laughs> like well, yeah, but I think if you have the, the right collaborators. Um, <laughs> You know, George Wolf. I, I recently heard him speak, and he said collaboration is not compromise. You know, it's like having really, really smart people in a room together, each making each other smarter. And I think, um, you know, really good collaborations are really respectful. And if you, I think in order for collaboration to work, you have to basically trust the aesthetic values of your collaborators so that you can, in a given moment, say, um, I don't know what you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. It feels horribly wrong to me, but let's try it and see. It and I feel like I do that much more gracefully than I did when I was doing it only because the brothers were twisting my arm behind my back and making me do it, for which I'm very grateful. But um, yeah, I think you, if you have the right collaborators, you can make something so much more interesting than you could make on your own. And that's. Yeah, sometimes I, I wish as as critics or theorists we could have more collaborators, right? That's kind of, um, yeah, that's frowned upon a little bit. But, um, but but you had mentioned earlier that it wasn't until the the academics started writing about WOW that there was a critical mass. And I know that, well, we sometimes we get a little bogged down in the theory and the slashes and the dashes and the, right, the jargon that perhaps isn't so helpful for creating a dialogue with the artist. Is there, you know, is there a kind of conversation you would like to have with critics and scholars about your work that 
is or you know that might be more helpful to you, right? Um, I mean, Jill Dolan does write about this beautifully mm -hmm. about trying to have a kind of conversation um, in yeah. in the blogosphere or in the in the public discourse, not just in kind of you know academic books. But is there a kind of conversation that that you would like to have? Well, my aims are not theoretical, yeah, and they're not intellectual, and they're not political, they're theatrical. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, someone said to me today, was asking me something about memoir and saying, do you ever teach a memoir? And I said, I don't teach it, I would never teach it, I'm not, I don't, I don't think of myself as doing memoir. I like reading memoirs, but I, it's not, my, my interest is in making theater. And so I, I don't, so and and my interest is is in the craft of what you put together, how what you may have people do on stage to make a dynamic theater experience. And when I think theoretically, the thing that I'm interested in thinking about is yeah. what is theater. I think, and then there are all kinds of political implications to that. I think that follow after that, but that is that is my personal interest. Would you say the same is true, or? Well, I'm, I yeah, I mean absolutely, and I and I've always I always have this curious part of me of like, well, what are you seeing? You know, what are you yeah. what are you seeing through your frame? You know, like we have our frame, like we're making our frame and we're presenting it, and then, you know, the audience, be they academics or critics or just regular old people, you know, what are what are what are you seeing? And because it's always really fascinating because. You know, this happens with the brothers, you know, like, uh, uh, again, like in, in Brave Smiles, um, you know, uh, sometimes there are little, you know, there's only five of us, but there's many characters in the play, so there's like practical things that have to happen, and, you know, we put in these like little moments just to give somebody like five extra seconds to change their costume backstage, <laughs> like really, like, so you look, you gaze lovingly out the window, you know, like this, like you just take a longer take, Right, and that's a very practical matter, and and people see they're like, oh, that is so amazing, da da da. You know, it's just like really so. You know, Babs can cross across the back, <laughs> you know, or something like that. So so it is always, you know, real. I mean, that's an extreme example, but um, you know, what what are what is the audience seeing is is always very very interesting um, to me. I I, I don't necessarily. I mean, I don't change what I'm doing because of that, mm -hmm. but it is, you know, we don't, we, yeah, I think yeah, you come with the, your own subjectivities, that's right? The, so. That's sort of, I think, maybe where those conversations have a little bit of a disconnect, which is the experience an audience has of theater is made out of this other thing, yeah. and we don't, we do, Theater is made of things that will let an audience have an experience, but that experience is not had on the stage. That's not what we do. We don't create, we don't create an effect that then you feel. We do these mechanical things. It's all artifice that we put together in a certain way so that the audience will have. And so, not that it's not gratifying if you feel like you've done your show well to hear people talk about that effect. But that's not what we're, we're making the mechanics so that thing that can take place. And I think sometimes if it works well, I think you feel like that thing that you feel is what happened on stage, uh -huh. but it's not what happened on stage. So.
once a trip, once a, a month to Israel. Not every year. Yeah. <laughs> No matter how bad it has to be, we walk there, we walk there, we walk there. We walk there. I love I love Pastor Dr. Sadler's opinion on that because she's so sincere. <laughs> and she she loves us. And that's the type of stuff that we can learn from her. Mm. On on the love mm. of the sons of Israel, the children of Israel, the sons of Israel. Loving loving the sons of Israel. Mm. And he shows that one bit of the book too. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's marvelous, and I think that's that's a uh, a part of camp. I think that that in my students, at least, they miss the love part of camp, mm. right? That it's not just over the top lampooning, but it's love for that object, right? And it's a recuperation of that object. And sometimes it's it's that part that's the love that's missing. I think you're absolutely right about that. Um, I'm gonna have to think about that a lot more because I I do. I think that's Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Lisa. I mean, co go see Lear de Bessonet's work, the woman who directed Good Person of Sichuan, and come to see that show on a night when the, f and it was like this much more at La Mama, go to see it when the foundry has a bunch of their community people who they have cultivated to come to the theater, come there. So that now at the public, where the tickets mm -hmm. for Good Person of Sichuan are $70, okay, um, <laughs> Uh, and then, you know, it's an audience that's interested in it, but if it's just that public theater subscriber audience, then, they're, then they watch the play and they're like, oh, this is an interesting interpretation of Brecht. Um, and then if you have, um, then when you have those, you know, these various people who Melanie Josephs has, these people yeah. she's cultivated all over, they're not theater goers. They're people who 
deal with dilemmas that match various dilemmas that are in the play. And they're not thinking this is an interesting use of this artifice. First of all, I think people know how to watch theater. They know how to watch theater. They know how they understand that theater is artifice. And if if so, and that, you know, that play is story, story, story. You just have to follow the story. It's not naturalistic, it's very fantastical. And if you get a bunch of kids in there, we're doing a, a student mandate tomorrow. I can't wait. You know, if you get a bunch of, uh, you know, people from, you know, some community uh, organization in the Bronx, they come to see that show and they're like, they're just on that ride. And they're, you know, having, a, they're immediately laughing. They're immediately like rooting for people, which is how Brecht wrote that play. And it's happening, and then everybody is having a good time. Everybody is in it, and it feels like it's about people. It's about, and then, then you can feel the politics of that play also. It's not theoretical. It's actually about real things, as Shakespeare is. It's about real things that people encounter, real dilemmas that people encounter. And if you have people who, are, you know, live in a more protected world or they just watch a lot of theater and as we would, you know, we, um, they're comparing it to other theater that they've seen, whatever they're watching with that critical distance. It's a very different thing than if you have a sort of more open, um, naive in a certain way audience who will actually encounter the, the theater and the story in a in a more immediate visceral way, kind of way, visceral yeah. way, yeah. yeah. And it's really, really, really fun for everybody. Yeah, not not only is that a dilemma, but it's one that has no answer. <laughs> you know, that play, right? There's no good answer to that problem, right? And that's real, yeah. Right? And yeah, and it's a. I saw it this weekend. It's. Brilliant production. And I also think, I mean, I heard somebody who runs a big not-for-profit theater here one time say, well, you know, there's just only so much audience. And I said, I just want to correct you. There's infinite audience. There's infinite audience. Maybe not for the plays I do. Maybe not for the plays you do. There is infinite audience for theater. So, um, yeah. And I, I think that's, that's an infrastructural problem. Um, yeah. But there are people who are... You know, there will always be theater. There will always be audiences for theater. Yeah, and there are audiences for Taylor Max epic Lily's Revenge, five hours of theater, right? I mean, that's fantastic. Um, and you, you know, I saw it again in, in Cambridge, and you couldn't beg, borrow, or steal a ticket to stand there for five hours. So there are audiences, you know, for, for yes. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question. Well, please join me. What a treat. Thank you both very much. Thank you.